Hey guys, what is more important to you? This temporary world that is passing away or God? I want you to answer this question honestly while I explain the following five things that all Christian men should stop doing. Let's start with number one. Stop pursuing the wrong things. You could pursue a lot of things in life, money, relationships, power, but only one pursuit brings satisfaction on earth because only one pursuit matters for eternity, becoming a true man of God. I wrote that on the back cover of my new book called Bold Pursuit, a 90-day devotional for men seeking the heart of God. I believe one of the worst things a man can do is to waste his God-given life, to pursue in his head the big things, the small things according to his three-pound brain because he thinks he knows better than God, to pursue that and to miss out on what God has actually planned for him. And if you think that you know better than God with your small brain, then it's extremely sad because you're missing out on real purpose and fulfillment and peace and God's blessing. Because if you walk in your own way and not in God's way in, within His will, then God's blessing is not going to be on your life. Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. This is why so many men are complaining and they say things like, I don't understand why God is not helping me in this. And maybe it's because you are trying to force doors open that were never meant to be open because that's your will. You're not following God's will. You're not going through the door that He has actually planned for you and keeping open for you that you need to go through. You see, as a reborn Christian, you need to abide in Christ and then you will produce the right fruit. John 15 verse 4, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. You see, that is what it means to be a true child of God. And if you are a true son of God, then you don't just think that God is some part of your life now and then when you feel like it, He is your life now because He made you a new creation. He is the one that directs your paths and you follow Him with your whole heart and soul. Do you do that? Galatians 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Are you a true son of the almighty living God? You know, sometimes we forget who God is. We don't have enough respect for Him. We just take Him for granted. Oh, my relationship with God. And you kind of bring Him down to your level. He is God. Do you understand that? In the Old Testament, only the high priest was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies only once a year. But now after Jesus came, died on the cross, rose from the grave. Now when we accept him because of grace, God saves us. He declares us as righteous. And that is why we can all enter the Holy of Holies, because that is now, you know, there's no temple anymore because our bodies is the temple of God and we can approach his throne with confidence, but with a lot of respect because He is still God and He is holy. And when you live that way, when you put God first in everything, everything that you do, suddenly everything else falls into place. Everything you do is blessed because you put God first. And that is the requirement for all His promises. And then when you start to do that, when you live this life of complete surrender, then you start to realize, man, now you have everything you need. You have fulfillment, you have purpose, and you have peace that surpasses all understanding. 
Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 24, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That is the life of complete surrender and the only life where you will find true peace that surpasses all understanding even when you're going through trials and tribulations because you understand, <laughs> because you abide in God, Him in you, you in Him. You can see the bigger picture of life. Everything starts to make sense and you move forward and you can see how God is just blessing you. And you get the power to overcome any kind of obstacle that this life throws at you because now you're not tackling these things alone anymore with only your limited power, mind, capability, three pounds small brain. A lot of people think they know better than God. But now you have the Holy Spirit in you, the power of God. He is leading you and helping you. He is in your corner fighting for you. Let's move on to the next one. Stop thinking you are always right. That kind of arrogant, prideful, hard attitude does not fit in with the new Christian lifestyle. That might have been part of your old lifestyle, the person you used to be. But remember, you are a new creation in Christ. And now you are humble. You live according to the spirit, not according to that old sinful flesh that's full of the ego and the I, me, me, me. Sinful flesh. There's a change. Because you love God, you also love other people because that's the Holy Spirit in you. You know, you've received that unconditional sacrificial love from God, agape love. And God's love for other people flows through you. <laughs> so then you start to understand, man, you need to be the light of the world. You need to be a sweet smelling aroma. So it's more important to win the person that it is to win the argument in the flesh full of pride because you just want to win the argument. You keep on fighting and you, you want to be right. Forgetting that you need to win the soul of that person for Christ. So you might win the argument, but you will lose the person. Proverbs 16 verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. One of the ugliest things that you can see is a self-professed Christian man arguing, quarreling with an unbeliever, for example, about religious things, but he's doing it through the flesh, full of pride, full of ego, because he wants to win that conversation, that argument. And he's not sharing the gospel, taking the lead of the Holy Spirit in truth and in love being humble. Proverbs 11 verse 2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. And Proverbs 16 verse 5 says, everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. You know, there's a lot of people who they just want to keep on fighting. You know, they're like, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. And they will keep on fighting <laughs> because it is so important for them to be right. You know, that is from the sinful flesh. And even when they are right and the other person says, oh, okay, you're right. They will, they will keep on going. They will say things like, yeah, you see, you see, you see, I told you. Even when things happen at the end, they're like, I told you this happened. You don't need to do that. That kind of attitude is not part of the new life in Christ. Examine yourself, ask yourself and be brutally honest. Do you think you're always right? Will you argue with them until they see things the way you do because you think you're always right? If you are, then you need to stop living in sin because that is sin. You're quenching the Holy Spirit and you need to obey God, not just in the way in what you say, but also in the way you say things. Romans 12 verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Did you read that? It says sometimes be wise in your own sight. No, it didn't say that. Did it say 50% of the time be wise in your own sight? No. 
that it's a 1% of the time. Be wise in your own sight. No. It says never, never, never be wise in your own sight. No one likes people who think that they are always right because they reek of puffed up egos. And it, pe and it pushes people away from the gospel. God actually says in Philippians 2 verse 3, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. If you truly love God with everything that is in you, you will also love other people and you will care about them. You will try to understand things from their perspectives. And you know, the biggest challenge for every reborn believer, Christian, is not other people or the things in this world. It is the self-life. That is why Jesus said, if you want to follow him, you need to deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow him. Pick up your cross. That means you need to crucify yourself with Jesus, that old sinful flesh. Let's move on to the next one. Stop making excuses for your fleshly nature. Christian men do that a lot more than they think. For example, some make excuses or lie like the rest of the world. They get to work late and then they say things like, Sorry, I'm late. It was traffic. Well, they actually have a cup of coffee takeaway in their hand, meaning they took 10 to 20 minutes to buy that coffee. And also knowing that everyone else in the meeting had to sit in the same traffic. So it's just an excuse. That's not the reason why you're late. The reason you're late is because you took some time to get that coffee. And also because you didn't plan ahead. You didn't wake up early enough. Another excuse I sometimes hear at church, at Bible study, is this. I could not spend time studying the Bible this week because I was too busy. Because I was too busy. That's an excuse. An excuse to try and rationalize your sinful behavior. You make time for that which is a priority to you. So if you didn't make time for God that week, it means... You took other things and put it above God. You made those things a priority. While God says you have to make Him your priority. Do you know most men who say that they are Christians have never read the entire Bible? They don't really make God their priority. And you know, I've heard this saying a lot, you know, in the Christian community. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. But what they don't understand is that is what the Bible does. The Bible equips us. So some of them sit back and they want God to do everything. It is your responsibility to grow with Christ, to read Scripture, to take time to spend time with God. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now listen to this. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The Bible equips you for every good work. But how will you be equipped if you don't read the Bible? You can't. And as men, you know, we are normally straight with one another. So let me be straight with you. Stop the excuses. Spend time with God. Read your Bible. And then stop to be just a hearer of the word and start to be a doer. Because Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Nowhere does it say that only preachers or pastors need to study the Word of God and know it. It doesn't say that at all. They cannot live your Christian life for you. You have your own relationship with God. When you die, you alone will stand in front of God. 
not your pastor, not your husband, not your wife, not your children, no one in your family, none of your friends, you alone. You will have to give account. So, let us stop making the same kind of excuses like the rest of the sinful world. We are called to be set apart. We are ambassadors of Christ. We are in the world, but we are not part of the world. Let's go on to the next one. Stop saying vulgar words like the rest of the sinful world. You know, I'm shocked when I'm when I hear a, uh, someone who say that they're a Christian and I just hear oof, they speak these vulgar words. I feel ugh, the Holy Spirit in me, ah, that pain. And they continue the conversation as if everything is fine. And they even use God's name in vain. Having no respect for God's name. Oh, would Jesus do that? Would Jesus speak vulgar words? And you know, I'm telling you these things because I actually really care about you because a lot of people out there are sleeping. They think that they're Christians, but they're living like the rest of mankind. So they're lukewarm or they're not Christian at all. They think they are, but they'll get a big surprise at the day of judgment. And I don't want that to happen to you. I don't want you to be self-deceived. Ephesians 4 verse 29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. You see, true faith doesn't mean that you just continue to live in sin and don't care about it at all. Paul wrote about this in detail in Romans. The rest of the New Testament talks about it as well. Faith without works is dead in James. Faith is not like a jacket that you just sometimes put on and take off when you feel like it. You have been changed. God Himself changed you. He did a work of regeneration and gave you the Holy Spirit, which means you have a whole new spiritual nature within you. And then if you do sin, the Holy Spirit will convict you. You'll feel bad about it. Until you can't take it anymore, and you'll say, God, please forgive me. I'm sorry. I don't want to live the way I used to live anymore. If that regeneration did not happen, if you didn't truly repent and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it's not a thing that you grow up as in a tradition. Oh, I'm just now Christian. No, you need to be a reborn Christian. John 3, Jesus talks about in detail. If you didn't truly accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and He came to change you, give you the Holy Spirit, then you are not a Christian. Even if you grew up in a Christian home or go to church or read your Bible sometimes. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. People will be judged by every careless word they speak. So with your new lifestyle, it is impossible to say the same kind of things that you used to say. Vulgar words, bad words, and even breaking people down in the flesh. You are supposed to be the light of the world. Jesus said in Matthew 12, The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. If you truly are a Christian man, why would you want to tell dirty jokes and speak vulgar words? I ask you again, would Jesus do that? Ephesians 5 verse 4 Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. How have you been living your life recently? I'm just talking about vulgar words, but there might be other sin as well. 
How have you been living your life recently? Be brutally honest with yourself. This is important because if you would die today, how will God judge you? The reason you're still alive means that God is still giving you a time of grace. And every time you take that breath, it is a breath closer to your death. When that time of grace is done, and then it is judgment. And then you will stand in front of God who is love, yes, but He is also righteous because He is holy. Let's move on to the next one. Stop being lazy. Spiritual laziness is sin. Paul tells us in Romans 12 verse 11, do not be slothful in zeal but fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. This is a lot more important than you think. And I believe that we should preach about this a lot more in church. Let me read you something very interesting. From my book, Bold Pursuit, a 90-day devotional for men seeking the heart of God. Day 48. Someone once said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Often the reason good men do nothing is because of spiritual apathy or laziness. This type of laziness or slothfulness creates a vacuum for evil to fill. The Greek word translated as laziness in the Bible is akedia, which means the absence of care. This kind of laziness isn't caused by a lack of physical energy. It is a sinful condition of the heart that causes people not to care about anyone or anything. The consequences of laziness are dramatic. Proverbs 21 verse 25 says, The desire of the lazy one puts him to death, for his hands refuse to work. Spiritual laziness is especially dangerous. That's when we don't care enough to read our Bible or go to church or pray to our Heavenly Father. The Bible has an interesting command to those who are lazy. Go to the ant, you lazy one. Observe its ways and be wise, which having no chief, officer or ruler, prepares its food in the summer and gathers its provision in the harvest. Proverbs 6, verse 6 to 8. In its own way, the ant understands that work is an investment. It diligently gathers food while it's available and stores it away. The ant understands that a time of plenty is the perfect time to prepare for a time of need. So it puts in the work to prepare for winter when provisions are scarce and life is harder. That's the reality God wants us to understand. Spiritual work is an investment. Making the effort to study scripture, go to church, and spend time daily in prayer has immediate benefits, of course, but it also has long-term benefits. Being grounded in scripture can help us resist Satan's temptations, as he did for Jesus during his temptation in the wilderness. Matthew 4, verse 1 to 11. Surrounding ourselves with a network of fellow believers can inspire us to live out our faith in bold and impactful ways. That's why Hebrews 10 verse 24 to 25 says, Let's consider how to encourage one another in love and good deeds, not abandoning our own meeting together, as is the habit of some people, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Staying in constant communication with our Heavenly Father can help us recognize His will for our life. To enjoy these spiritual benefits, we must resist the pull of laziness and stay disciplined in every area of our spiritual life. We must stay constantly aware that the work we do now to understand Scripture, build relationships with fellow believers, and maintain an open line of communication with God will pay dividends for the rest of our life. Now, at the end of each daily devotional, I ask you to dig deep because 
We need to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. So this is time to examine yourself and to be honest, dig deep. Laziness can seem like harmless self-indulgence, but that's what makes it so dangerous in our walk with Christ. We confuse doing our own thing with doing nothing. Ask yourself the following questions and answer them truthfully. 1. How have you been lazy in your spiritual life? 2. What habits can you develop to help you prevent laziness from getting a foothold? Take some time to answer these questions honestly, truthfully. And if you want to take a look at my book, I'll add all the information for you in the video description down below. Now, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. We have a lot of videos on the channel and we bring out weekly videos. So you might be interested to watch one of these playlists here. And before you go, always remember, life is short. So please do not waste yours. Bye, guys.